Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. If we could have you all take your seats, we're going to get started here very shortly. Um, we're going to go live. We're going to go live to uh, six other locations today. Uh, but before we do, just a little bit of housekeeping items for here at the Fargo location. Uh, one of our breakouts is the uh, Cecil breakout. And the intention with that breakout originally was to have a, a kind of a collaborative back and forth between Daryl Lingle and then uh, Chris Lee uh, with uh, Gate City Bank. Uh, unfortunately, Chris uh, is not able to make it. Uh, so Daryl will still be presenting. Uh, we encourage a lot of collaboration uh, for the individuals that are st still planning on attending that Cecil event. But if it does change what your, your plan is for uh, in terms of the breakouts, um, just to adjust accordingly that, that uh, Chris will not be there. So uh, again, before we go live, uh, this, this whole uh, seminar cannot uh, be made possible without, uh, you know, the, the members of Ide Bailey, you know, my coworkers, uh, the partners and the staff. Uh, if they're in the room, uh, if you could please stand up and uh, we can give you a round of applause for, for helping out today. <clears throat> Awesome, all right. Well, hopefully the live feed kicks in uh, for our, our locations that are our satellite. And thank you for coming and welcome to the 38th annual Ide Bailey Banker Seminar. My name is Shane Hussar, and I'm a partner here in our Fargo office, and I'm excited to be one of your hosts today. Our theme for today's event is Innovative Connections, and we are very excited to have you all join us. Now, I know what you're thinking, you know, innovation a lot of times can be a, a four-letter word, right? Change is hard. And at least for today, when we talk about connections, I don't mean closing down the bar at the reception, but if you do plan on doing that, you know, that's fair game. That's up to you. So the first word in our theme is tied to innovation. Now, our intention today is not to scare you into thinking that robots are going to take all of our jobs. Uh, I think if you remember, our speaker last year did a good job of that. Uh, Ron, that's not part of the agenda, right? Okay, good. Um, no, rather, we, we hope to shed some light on many of the innovations impacting the banking industry over the past several months. FinTech, AI, big data, and blockchain are more than just buzzwords gaining mainstream media attention. There are potential disruptors with the spotlight narrowly focused on the banking industry. In July, the Treasury Department issued a report entitled A Financial System That Creates Economic, economic Opportunities, Non-Bank Financials, FinTech, and Innovation, in which the word innovation was used 435 times, I counted. Within the report, the Treasury Department recommended embracing digitization, data, and competitive technologies, and urged regulators to align the regulatory framework to promote innovation. Earlier this month, the SEC launched their FinHub, an online web page devoted to innovation in FinTech, and the Federal Reserve Bank issued for comments on potential actions to facilitate real-time interbank settlements, of which one potential solution is blockchain technology, the topic of our keynote, keynote speaker. Do threats exist? Sure. Do opportunities exist? Absolutely. Our goal today is to help arm your own innovation arsenal against these threats and open your eyes to the opportunities that are beyond the horizon for you and your institutions. We appreciate your attendance today and look forward to having so many of you here to interconnect with your colleagues, friends, bank regulators, and professionals in the banking industry. Which brings me to the second word, connection. During today's seminar, connect with our speakers, our panelists, your peers, and let's further the com conversation in regards to innovation as they're presented to you today. We've established, established that our primary theme for today is on innovation, but we also have a host of great breakout sessions to provide industry updates, including our regulatory roundtable, tax reform, compliance, uh, fintech, and more. It's going to be a good day. But let's keep the conversation going even more. Let's use the internet. As you take in today's events, feel free to let people know that you're here and you're engaged. Connect with Ide Bailey on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter. Let us know you're here and let us know you're on board for today's theme by using the hashtag EBFutureReady. And let us know your takeaways on innovation. 
feel free to connect with me personally on LinkedIn or any one of the professionals within the firm. All right, before we get to our keynote, I would like also to expand a special thank you to Cheryl Knudsen, Sandy Sale, and Sherry Bittner, who have spent considerable time planning and organizing this event. Thank you to our Ide Bailey IT support team and the media productions team for providing technical assistance today. These people really make this event a success. Without innovative partners such as these, we would not be able to broadcast this seminar live today in our satellite locations in Bismarck, Oklahoma City, Tulsa, Billings, and Denver. I'd also like to thank the Ide Bailey professionals hosting at each one of these sites individually today as well. Finally, I'd like to extend a thank you to the Delta by Marriott management and staff for their great service for everyone here today. So with that, I'll introduce Gary Smith. Gary is the director of our financial institution services group for the firm. He has more than 25 years of public accounting experience providing audit, accounting, and consulting services to SEC, public sector, and financial institution clients. So with that, please welcome me, or join me in welcoming up Gary. Hello everyone, uh, we're excited to be video streaming, as Shane said, to uh, locations in our Bismarck, Billings, Denver, Oklahoma City, and Tulsa offices. Welcome to all of you out there, glad to have you today, and all of those of you here today in Fargo, please uh, welcome to our seminar. I hope everyone was able to get a hold of in your materials, there's going to be information on how to use our app. So if you have an Android or if you have a uh, iPhone, again, there's instructions on here how to get your app. There's uh, I Bailey events. You, you set up your profile. Innovate is in all caps is the keyword to get you into there. It's very important that you util utilize this. It talks about each of our programs and our locations. It also has our speaker bios as well as each of the presentations that you'll see today. So I encourage you to uh, some of our I, uh, Bailey folks are walking around. If you need help, uh, get them and they can uh, help you get that set up. So our theme for the 2018 I Bailey Banker Seminar is Innovative Connections. With that in mind, we have brought in speakers and thought leaders to help you look to innovate at your bank. To keep us all connected, we'll be using text and polling technology today during our presentation, uh, during the start of things off. Let's let everyone, if you can go ahead and get out your cell phones. Again, these are important things to get started with. I'll grab my cell phone here. So what I want you to do is everybody get out your cell phone and we're gonna talk a little bit about how to utilize the, uh, the uh, texting technology. So during our, we're gonna have an innovation panel today which is I think you're gonna be really, really happy to see these uh, speakers today for this. So I want you to get some really good questions, some real good thought questions. I think Ron, during his speech, will also have some time for some questions. So here's your opportunity to, to uh, be interactive with us and we'll get the questions uh, that'll come in. So on your cell phone, if you go to the texting technology and if you type in 223332, 2233 at the top when you put in like where the phone number goes, 22333. And then in the message, if you're going to type in EB Innovate, all caps, EB Innovate, one word, space, and then your question. So that's how you do your question. So I want to make sure that everybody knows how to do that. So we're going to utilize that technology uh, during Ron's presentation, during our innovation panel and then also during uh, the, uh, the regulatory panel that we have as a breakout later on too. So, and those of you, uh, those of you in our, our offsites, uh, please make sure that you use that technology as well. It's, it's, it's available for you. So I wanna start off first with uh, our first polling question. So here's our first question. I believe my bank is innovative. So, same technology, 22333 in your text. Then in, the, um, in the, the text box, I want you to type, if you believe your bank is innovative, do EB Innovative 01. Not so innovative, no. Type in EB Innovate 02, Innovate. 
We'll give a little bit of time here to, to get through that. So about um, almost two, not quite two thirds, but getting up to that, believe that their bank is innovative. So I challenge you today through these speakers that we have when we talk about blockchain and fintech, are you really innovative at your bank? And what are you doing at your bank to be innovative? So here's another question, another polling question for you. What are the top challenges to being innovative at your bank? The first question, the first one is, is it political or regulatory factors that keep you from being uh, innovative? Is it the current organ organizational culture which does not accept failure? Is it a lack of adequate IT structure? Is your IT structure too old to be able to help with the innovative side of things? The lack of innovative managers, employees. Is everybody stuck in their ways and they're not able to be innovative? Fear of being first to the market. So again, same texting technology using the same, you know, EB, Innovate, there's 03, 04, 05, 06, and 07. And we'll wait a few minutes for that. This will be good information for our panel and for Ron as, as Ron gets to uh, his presentation. Thought about bringing one of those old phones with me today just to show you how innovation really was. You remember those big phones? You put it up to here and it reaches out to here and the bag phone. Everybody remember the bag phone? But I didn't. I saved you that. Okay, so it looks like uh, the consensus here is the lack of innovation managers and employees. So uh, the people within sign up, in, inside of some of our financial institutions are or maybe that uh, lacking a little bit on the innovative side. So the question that we always want to ask for our regulator panel is we want to see what, uh, you know, what issues you're facing at your institution, which are the following hot topics you'd be most interested in hearing our regulators talk about when the panel from our three regulators get up. And also, your, I know some will have a state regulator that will talk as well. So in your, in your area, what are your concerns? Is it the ag economy and energy? Is that the implications that are going on? Is it the burden of regulation? Is it CECL? Is it cybersecurity and IT? Is it lending concentrations? Is it succession planning and, and staffing issues? Those, those of the like. So we'll give it a, about a minute here to kind of get some results. So this will be good for the regulatory panel later on today. Okay, so it looks like the burden of regulation, I think that was our number one last year, along with maybe the ag economy and succession planning is up there as well. And I think we'll hear about cybersecurity when we get together with the reg panel as well. So thank you for that information. We appreciate that. Uh, again, I want to remind everyone as we get ready to call up Ron here now to speak uh, about our, t our ability to um, ask questions. Again, 22333. EB Innovate space and then your question. And again, we'll be keeping track of the questions up here. I believe he's saved some time for, uh, for questions at the end. So for several years now, blockchain technology and crypto assets have dominated headlines with both hype and promise. 
from the solutions that technology is meant to offer to confusion about whether crypto assets, include, including Bitcoin, are even legal, multiple industries around the world have been struggling to understand what it all means for their future. In this session, attendees will be able to cut through this noise and learn what blockchain really is and what the technology is designed to do. We'll also discuss what blockchain means for regional and community banks and how to be connected and part of this evolution. Now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker for our general session today, Ron Quaranta. Ron possesses over 27 years of experience in the financial services and technology industries. He currently serves as the chairman of the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance, the leading nonprofit trade association promoting the comprehensive adoption of blockchain technology and crypto assets across global markets. Prior to this, Ron served as the CEO of DerivaTrust Technologies, a pioneering software and technology firm for financial market participants. Ron was also the editor and contributor, author of the recently published book, Blockchain in Financial Markets and Beyond, Challenges and Applications. He is a sought after speaker and, and writer regarding financial technology and innovation and serves as an advisor to multiple startups and corporations focused on fintech innovation and blockchain, tech, uh, blockchain technology. Please help me welcome Ron Corancha. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you to my friends at Ide Bailey for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you for all of you who are joining us remotely. Um, I wanted to talk to you today about blockchain technology, about crypto assets, which will become part of your future, and what I believe the future impact on the world of community banking will be. I have some very specific objectives for this session. I want to talk and define blockchain. There's still so much noise out there. I want to give you some historical context to where blockchain comes from, and why is it really used? We'll talk about blockchain in the global marketplace. There's still a lot of noise about pilots and proof of concepts. I'm going to show you where it's actually making an impact across global financial markets. I'll talk about some specific examples for community banking. This is not just a large bank conversation. As a matter of fact, it's a conversation across multiple industry verticals. I'll tell you how to keep up. Things are evolving very quickly. I want you all to walk out with the tools and understanding to really begin to dive into what blockchain means for your business and your long-term strategy. And then finally, I'll talk about how to adopt, what it means for your business, what it means for junior partners within your organizations, what it means for the next generation coming into your companies and for the next generation of your clients. And briefly, to tell you about the Wall Street and Blockchain Alliance, and Gary, thank you for the kind introduction. The Wall Street Blockchain Alliance is a nonprofit trade association with a mission to guide and promote comprehensive adoption of blockchain across global marketplaces. We're an advocacy group for global markets in what we're calling a blockchain age. We operate as a neutral, unbiased steward of education and cooperation between our members, and our members are the gamut of firms that you'd imagine, large and small, from banking and insurance and accounting and law. And I can tell you it's a conversation that pervades every level of the organization. It is no longer just a technology conversation. It's a strategy conversation. And I'd like to start this presentation the way I often do, with a relatively provocative statement. In the future, virtually every function in global markets will be displaced, disintermediated, and decentralized. We've all seen displacement. I suspect none of us used a horse and buggy to get here. We've also all seen disintermediation. Did anyone go to a brick and mortar travel agency to book their travel? Decentralization is a different thing. Decentraliz decentralization changes the economic dynamic between counterparties. Decentralization gives us the power to say we can exchange value with each other. And that fundamentally reinvents many of the platforms for how we do what we do. Think about it this way. 
In the same way the internet gave us a powerful way to share and, to share and access information, blockchain now gives us a powerful way to share and access value. And that's an important distinction. Even simpler, I tend to try to operate in simple terms. And I am not a deep technologist by training. I've just managed enough technology teams to ask astoundingly dumb questions. But if the internet is data over IP, the tool set that you use every day, think about blockchain as money over IP. And I know some of my colleagues in the blockchain and crypto asset space would look at that and think it's an oversimplification, and it is, but fundamentally, blockchain is a value transfer platform. And what I would suggest for everyone here is that our technology has finally caught up with our desire to transact without the need to trust the other party and without the need for an intermediary. And when I first read that to myself after I wrote it, it's a bit scary. We live in a world of intermediaries. We all are intermediaries. But what's happening is that blockchain technology and so many of the other technologies that we put under the innovation banner, AI and augmented reality and machine learning and more, are forcing us to evolve. And that's an important part of the dialogue for us every day. Another perspective, think about it as the internet of value. You may have heard that phrase often. The internet of information is the internet that we have today. TCP IP, many people don't realize we've been living with that for well over 30 years. But it's a communication protocol. It revolutionized how we exchanged information with each other, creating the information superhighway that we all know. And its first real use case was email. What I would suggest for all of you is that the internet of value powered by blockchain as a value exchange protocol reinvents how we do what we do. And that that first use case, that decentralization of trust manifested itself in Bitcoin. And I know that's still a dirty word for a bunch of people. But as you'll see later on in my presentation, it's something we need to understand. So what is it? What is blockchain? I get this question often, and I often joke with my colleagues. If you walk into a room of five people and say, what's blockchain? You'll probably get six different answers. Blockchain is a public ledger, a distributed, secure database that records transactions. That's all it is. It leverages cryptography and peer-to-peer -peer technology, and I'll talk a little bit about that, to group data into blocks, and to store them on an immutable chain of transactions. But most importantly, it accomplishes this without any trusted central authority. And hang on to that for a bit. You'll see why that idea is important, even when we talk about specifics like private blockchains. It's interesting that the innovation that blockchain represented originally put together technologies that have been around for a long time. Cryptography, which allows for secure communications. It provides data confidentiality. It ensures data integrity. It provides authentication and non-repudiation. And peer-to-peer -peer networks, which have been around for decades. A network of interconnected nodes that share resources amongst each other, but again, operating without the use of a centralized administrative system. Maintenance of a blockchain is performed by this network of nodes. Information is uploaded to the blockchain, then validated and approved prior to what we call final approval and addition. And these additions are broadcast to the network in real time. What does this mean? Simply put, we're all looking at the same thing at the same time. Where operators manage consensus, every node communicates to all the others on the network the changes that they've made and rely on the network itself to validate those changes. And I won't get into too much of the technicals, but I do want to say a couple of things about public and private keys because it'll be important for you to at least understand what they are. But public, private keys are how you access blockchain. If you've got younger staff, you probably hear them talking about wallets. 
Public keys are the public-facing anonymous addresses or accounts or wallets in a public blockchain. Private key is the matching key given to the owner. It's the password. It's a bit different. It's almost legend the amount of stories that are out there about people who were early investors in Bitcoin and they had thousands and thousands of Bitcoins and they lost their private key. That millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin are gone, never to be recovered. My wife still wants to know why I don't have millions and millions of dollars in Bitcoin. I'll have to figure that out. Public keys can be shared. Private keys can be known only to the owner. And one of the slides that we saw earlier, Gary, that you asked questions about was cybersecurity concerns. Blockchain doesn't make cybersecurity concerns go away. You need to still have sound cybersecurity policies. And I'll talk in a bit more detail about why blockchain is evolving, even how we manage cybersecurity. There are some very specific benefits to blockchain. Decentralization, again, no needing to trust a central authority. It's distributed, which makes it more reliable. Component failures are minimized across different operating systems within different industry verticals, including banking. Dispersed consensus, equal distribution of consensus authority. We don't have to rely on one organization, one node, one person to say that your information's right. The network will do that for us. And immutable, once that data is written to a blockchain, it cannot be modified. Now, I know there are probably some blockchain folks in the audience who understand a bit deeper the implications of that, and I guarantee there's a hand out there or someone who's watching who wants to raise their hand and ask about private blockchains, which we will definitely talk about. But ideally, <clears throat> you can't change that data. And it's transparent. The transaction history more easily audited, more accurate, more consistent. Think about the challenges across your industry of reconciliation. And you begin to understand how blockchain might re revitalize that work, how it might reinvent the reconciliation functions that we all deal with every day. I like to think about blockchain from a definition perspective with an analogy. If you think about blockchain as just a file on computers that contain blocks, Think about the blocks in a blockchain the way you'd think about the pages in a book. In a blockchain, each block references the previous block using what we call a fingerprint or a hash. Books do the same thing. The fingerprint for a book is what? The page number. Page 10 always comes after page 9. Page 30 always comes after page 29. In a blockchain, those fingerprints are encrypted data sets that are uniquely derived from that block's contents. What I'm saying to you is that block 10 knows what's in block 9. Block 100 knows what's in block 99. And that's what makes that data set immutable. That's what makes it so hard to change that data. Some other definition in items of origin, as you may, many of you probably know, it has its origins in digital currencies, most well known is Bitcoin. A bit later on, I'll dive into more details about that digital currency world, which was designed to allow for instantaneous transactions that are anonymous and transparent. That drives regulators crazy. But here's the thing, anonymous and transparent does not mean invisible. There are tool sets being developed right now with companies around the world that leverage public and private blockchains and leverage a tool set to track transactions. So this kind of perception that blockchain is only meant for illicit activity, digital currencies are only meant for illicit activity, it's not wholly true at all. It's meant to represent a borderless transfer of value, which makes the international aspect of blockchain a bit challenging. And it's important to realize, if we're talking about Bitcoin specifically, it was only expected to be a payment system. Everything else you're hearing about blockchain is an evolution from that original model, which first went online in January of 2009. We're approaching our 10-year anniversary. Blockchain is a transparency machine. It deals with the problem of double spending. 
You can never spend what you do not have. It allows for transfers of value that are usually financial in nature, but not necessarily, and I'll show you some specific examples later on. We talked about it existing in a peer-to-peer -peer network and using cryptography and digital signatures. And the mechanisms, the very structure of what blockchain is meant to accomplish makes it very difficult to change historical records. And at scale and size, it becomes almost impossible. I did not draw this. I'm a much worse artist than this. But one example of why you can't cheat at Bitcoin. Let's say we're a blockchain. Let's say we're all working on block number 91. And let's assume Gary is a particularly nefarious player. And he wants to modify one of those blocks. He wants to say Ron handed him a million Bitcoin. Let's think about that for a moment. What does Gary have to do? He has to make that change and then change every single block after that point. And remember, we're part of that network. We're watching the network. We're all working on that latest block. He'd have to make that change, and he'd have to make it before we got done checking the latest block. An oversimplification from a computer science perspective, certainly. But think about the computing power required to do that. At size and scale, and I've often heard it said that the Bitcoin blockchain, by way of example, has more computing power than all the supercomputers in the world. It's a lot of expensive computing power. And there's this ongoing conversation when we get to specific industry verticals of public versus private blockchains. We know we live in a world where fully public, open, anonymous, decentralized transactions don't make sense. That's not our universe. Privacy concerns, data and identity concerns, regulations, legislation prevent us from living in that world. And for good reason. But what we've begun to see is this evolution of private blockchains that are not fully public, decentralized networks. Private blockchains are systems where access permissions are controlled, where the right to modify or read blockchain is restricted to a few users. So private blockchains maintain the partial guarantees of authenticity and the decentralization that blockchain provides while operating within the world that we know. Private blockchains are the primary focus of all enterprise implementations, particularly in financial markets. We're also seeing consortium blockchains, groupings of organizations from the same industry segment, insurance, supply chain, yes, banking, working together to leverage blockchain technology and realize the benefits of what it offers. And so some of the main comparisons, I believe you get access to this, this slide through the application, is comparing public versus private, and the one that always jumps out to me, legal recourse. In a public blockchain, there is no legal recourse. And I know some people have said to me, well, Ron, we've seen the news. FBI took Bitcoin from criminals, and that was legal recourse. It's a different thing. They took the private key of someone who committed a crime but there's no legal recourse for a public blockchain transaction. There's no FDIC to go to. There's no government regulator to knock on the door and say, help, Ron took my coins. There's no centralized authority to go to and say, hey, reset my private key, I lost it, and I think I'm a millionaire. But in a private blockchain, all of the regulatory framework that you, we all know still apply. And there are other blockchains. We often have this monolithic conversation. I'll have a colleague that approaches me and says, Ron, when will the blockchain take over the world? There are many of them. These are alternative blockchains that are based on blockchain technology in concept and or code. Most of the public blockchain code is open source. If you have technology teams or associates on your organizations, let them play around with the open source code. They generally add functionality to the original blockchain design, either targeting performance or anonymity or storage or applications. And this is just an example of some of the names. And some of these names are backed by and sponsored by some of the biggest names in financial markets and technology. Corda, Ethereum, Hyperledger, 
backed by the Linux Foundation and in no small part by IBM. Quorum, JP Morgan has its own blockchain. And so again, some of those biggest providers are working to deliver blockchain-based solutions and services for their clients around the world. Names we've come to know and expect, IBM, Microsoft, Amazon Web Services, Oracle, SAP, FIS. And there are existing use cases that are becoming production ready or, or are already production ready. Cross-border payments, the ideal solution for blockchain. Transferring a value which has always been expensive and slow. Blockchain speeds that up and simplifies that process. There's a company out there many of you may know right now called Ripple. Ripple's mission is to reinvent cross-border payments. Share trading. There's not an exchange in the world that is not looking at blockchain technology to evolve how they trade their securities. As a matter of fact, in Australia, the Australian Stock Exchange has warranted that by 2021, I believe, their entire clearing and settlement platform will be based on blockchain technology. Smart contracts, if you have not heard about smart contracts, and I'll talk about it in a bit more detail, you will encounter smart contracts. I promise you. I'm very privileged to have several attorneys that are part of the WSBA legal working group. And for any attorneys out there, please don't take this comment the wrong way, but you've not lived until you've been in a conference room with 50 attorneys talking about blockchain and Bitcoin and laws and smart contracts that aren't smart. But what happens when blockchain enables us to execute commercial transactions automatically? when smart contracts automatically enforce the obligations of the parties in those contracts. And you'll see a specific example in a little while. Online identity management. Blockchain platforms right now are being used to manage identity for users across an entire range of activities, including anti-money laundering and know your customer requirements. Striking directly at the heart of how bankers do what they do and offer services to their clients. Loyalty and rewards. American Express, as I understand it, and I haven't looked at the latest statistics, is the largest loyalty rewards program in the world on a dollar value basis. And those loyalty rewards sit as deferred liabilities on the books and records of those providers. Blockchain makes transparency and traceability easier, cheaper, more efficient, more effective. What happens when bankers can create and offer through their service providers enhanced loyalty programs? How does that evolve how we do what we do? What if you can leverage blockchain, trans trans uh, sorry, blockchain technology to offer greater relationship with your clients? And it's not just a financial markets use case. Everything from how you get diamonds, preventing blood diamonds from going through, financial, uh, going through global markets, to network infrastructure, to blockchain and the internet of things, in the next few years, 50 trillion interconnected devices will be available around the world. They're all going to be transferring value for you, leveraging blockchain technology. Even real estate. I'll show you a specific example a bit later on, but the relatively inefficient process that buying and selling real estate represents is being reinvented because of blockchain technology and crypto assets. And the business logic with smart contracts that I referenced. What happens when contract terms are shared and replicated on an immutable ledger? A lot of my lawyer friends are always bothered by this because a whole bunch of them make money settling disputed contracts. But what happens when the events that empower those contracts are automatically invoked? What happens when value transfer itself as part of those contracts are automated as well? How does that change the dynamic of banking and law and real estate and insurance? And this is an industry not without its challenges from a risk and regulation perspective. It is obviously of great interest to law enforcement agencies, as well as tax authorities, and as well as legal regulators. I've had the dubious distinction of speaking to a lot of them. Those are always fun conversations. Authorities have been struggling to understand how crypto assets and blockchain 
fits into their existing frameworks, but they're coming to realize that those frameworks need to evolve. If we're talking about contracts and we talk about things in the United States like UCC evolution, that's happening right now. Several agencies have already enacted regulation or brought opinions about things like digital currencies and blockchain. From a tax perspective, from a legality and securities perspective. But the most interesting thing about the regulator conversations, regulators are beginning to look at the innovation itself and wondering, what if blockchain is a tool for regulatory compliance? What if blockchain allows bankers and insurance companies and supply chain companies and healthcare companies to comply more easily, more efficiently, more cheaply, more effectively? What does that reduced cost of compliance do to your business? What happens in the world when there's a, less, a growing, a diminishing list and risk of regulatory violation? Even from the accounting perspective, we're very privileged to be partners with AICPA. And we have this conversation a lot, re reinventing and re reviewing previous accounting scandals and banking scandals. What would have happened in a blockchain world? And just to share with you some of those developments, this is a fast-paced, fast -paced, rapidly evolving space. But in the summer, the SEC itself said they're not going to change security laws to cater to cryptocurrencies. <clears throat> but those rules will evolve. FinCEN has issued guidance around administrators and exchangers. The SEC publicly stated, for those of you who know Ether and Ethereum, that it's not a security. So now the SEC has opened the door to global conversations, sorry, to national conversations around what constitutes a security? What is appropriately decentralized? We've been very privileged to speak to Congress as well as regulators and talk about the idea that the United States needs to figure out some of those regulations. Or we will watch innovation leave the United States. Of course, every vertical from banking to insurance to food supply to healthcare and beyond. And some of you may not want to believe it, but crypto assets are here and they're here to stay. The market cap of all crypto assets, and it's always funny when I try to put these presentations together, they'll say, get these presentations to us at some period of time before the event. And all of this information's outdated already. But as of October 22nd, the market cap for all crypto assets was over $200 billion. Bitcoin was well over half that. But what most regular people don't realize is that there are over 2,100 crypto assets around the world across 15,000 different markets. And yes, I know many of you will look at that and think, wow, that's hype and there's a lot of froth in that. And you're absolutely right. But some of those assets are important some of those assets will be here to stay. Stellar and Ethereum and Bitcoin. And indeed, there's this growing belief that we're looking at a new asset class. CFTC's already approved futures. You will have clients that will own some of these assets in the future, particularly when we look at the generational shifts that are happening. Initial coin offerings, reinventing how businesses raise money. And it was almost legend in 2017, young people were raising millions upon millions of dollars until the SEC stood up and said, hey, you're offering securities, you're breaking the law. But that innovation is now out there. And to show you how real that innovation is and how important it is, Fidelity Investments, $2.5 trillion in assets under management, has an entire division, Fidelity Digital Asset Services, we've met with them focused on cryptocurrencies and crypto assets and blockchain technology across their entire client base. Just real briefly, because I know I, I can talk about this for hours, as I was telling my friends from Hyde Bailey, um, ICOs are cryptocurrencies sold to investors in the form of tokens. If you have not had a client who's approached you and said, I have an ICO, I don't know what to do with it, I promise you, you will at some point. They're sold in exchange, usually for other cryptocurrencies, and they're supposed to become functional units within their network. They're, they'll become the Bitcoins of their particular network. But regulators have clamped down on those. They were security offerings. 
There's always the frightening story of the young coder somewhere around the world who raises five, six, ten million dollars leveraging an ICO and disappears with investor money. And I can tell you right now there are active investigations happening all over the world to stop that. But the innovation that that represents is here to stay. In 2017, six billion dollars was raised this way. And so as you begin to look at this structure, as you begin to understand the fundamentals of what blockchain is, and hopefully this foundational layer of what the innovation means for your business, I want to talk about blockchain and community banking. And it's something that's been spoken about for a couple of years. Community banks stand to gain from blockchain if they work together. It's really funny when I do this to the accountants, one of the slides says, Account uh, blockchain will make auditors go away. My wife is an auditor. That, that didn't work out well for me that day. Credit unions and community banks, a recent ruling, can pool resources to fight money laundering. Independent banker, how blockchain can help you keep compliant. In this month, in October, federal agencies ruled that credit unions and community bankers can pool resources for anti-money laundering compliance. This is tailor-made for a blockchain solution. Community banks should be getting together right now to create that platform. Or to push your vendors to do it. Because I promise you they already are. What happens when the decisions around anti-money laundering compliance can be sped up and improved? How does that accelerate your business? How does that give you the ability to offer more to your clients more quickly? Know your customer requests. Arguably cause delays. Substantial duplication of effort. Remember what blockchain's meant to accomplish. What happens if one wallet entry represents all of the reporting that you need that's verified to know your customer? And you know the penalties involved with not doing KYC right. And so now prototypes are being developed to allow KYC statements for your customers that are stored on blockchain. Once you've KYC'd a customer, those documents are immutably stored and can be used over and over again and updated as appropriate. How much more efficient does your relationship with clients become if KYC is not a pain in the neck every single time they want to do something? Using blockchain as part of a platform with other banks, other organizations. Think about the interoperability that blockchain offers, insurers. Car rental, there's platforms being built right now that would take your rewards points and let the, you pay your car loan with them. Or your airline points, or tuition. What happens when you don't need to ask the customer for that information again? When you know your customer's documents are independently checked and verified, the data stored is irreversible, you have a single source of truth about your client that minimizes the risk and duplication and challenges of duplications of errors. And for those of you who have been through this process, there are errors. What about real estate? Blockchain right now goes far beyond cryptocurrencies. Land ownership registries. There's an entire nation in Eastern Europe, which embarrassingly, I forgot which one that was working to put all land title registries on an immutable blockchain, relying on the blockchain to verify ownership. What happens to your business model when you can instantly verify ownership interests for your clients? What happens when the role of title agent and the challenges and costs of title insurance become minimized over time? What if the costs of doing that business for your client begin to approach zero? There are businesses right now that are trying to give people the opportunity to sell their house in hours. I would love to do that. Blockchain is being, designed, is being used right now in prototype to replace the difficult residential mortgage processing. What happens to economic value when you can move these processes along faster? What economic value do you unleash on your, for your clients and for your businesses if you can process trans like, transactions like this in a day?
when I was asked to talk about blockchain for community banks, I've had this conversation with community bankers before, and I was very privileged two or three years ago to speak to some community bankers in New England. Um, and I suspect it might have been a bit too early because I finished an hour-long conversation like this, uh, and I had a couple of um, very interesting gentlemen who looked at me and said, yeah, isn't this stuff illegal? After an hour of me explaining it. You focus on the needs of local businesses and families. You focus on relationships in ways that the larger banks can't. I bank with a large bank. And they do what they do, and they do it well. God, I hate going to them, though. What if blockchain gives you the platform and tools to evolve your relationships? What if blockchain is a platform that lets you make lending decisions based on your understanding of clients and their needs and their business models and what you're trying to offer them? What about the demographic and generational shifts? What about your client's children and grandchildren? They will be much more capable of managing and dealing with the technology offered by blockchain and crypto assets and AI and beyond. And there's these conversations about shifts to urban areas, young people going to urban areas. I'm not sure I fully believe it. We're looking at a world where technology, including blockchain as a value exchange platform, allows us to work anywhere. What if Fargo becomes the next technology hub? It's happening right now, around the world. What if you can deliver services and deepen your relationship across multiple generations because of what blockchain technology allows you to do? There was a report recently, and I'm sure I'm messing up the date, but by 2040, the majority of work in the United States will be solo remote workers, either on a contract basis or running their own little businesses. You need to be there and have an answer for that. And blockchain powers that. There are new platforms. Again, I mentioned Ripple earlier. Your clients are going to start making money, getting money, getting transfers of value, leveraging these platforms. So banks of all sizes will need to participate in these evolving ecosystems. And apart from the operational efficiencies and the speeding up of money transfers, what happens when blockchain technology and crypto assets allow you to evolve that omni-channel relationship in a deeper way? I have a 14-year-old niece. She's always on some kind of remote device. And that young lady is going to be using blockchain technology, whether or not she knows it. But community bankers and the work you're doing will set the stage for that for them for years to come. And again, you're not going to need to be deep technologists. No one in this room, unless you're already a coder, is going to need to code blockchain. You'll need to understand how it does what it does. You'll need to understand how you do what you do and evolve that in a blockchain world. A good friend of mine, Christopher Bruniski, who's an expert in crypto assets, said this perfectly. He said, the world is becoming hyper-local and hyper-global. Blockchain's causing that, and we all need to be ready for that. So to sum up some of the thoughts I'd love you to all walk out with, blockchain represents a single source of accuracy and completeness, and truth, and existence. Look at the processes you have now. Tell me what part of those processes don't ideally fit into what some blockchain is meant to offer you. What happens to your business model as those costs and opportunities for errors diminish? Where the reconciliation of data across multiple data sets, multiple entities, multiple clients, begins to evaporate away. How much more can you offer your clients? How much more capital gets freed up to increase the velocity of transactions? Smart contracts will alter how commerce is conducted across the globe. It's coming. There are hundreds and hundreds of lawyers around the world to try to figure out whether they should learn computer code or whether they should learn whether or not to say smart contracts are smart. But at the end of the day, smart contracts will be powering things behind the scenes. Everyone asks me the question, when will blockchain be here? When will smart contracts be here? My answer is when we stop talking about blockchain and smart contracts. 
Blockchain and smart contracts will seep into the fabric of global markets, including banking. And it might sound like hyperbole, but I've been in this space for a long time. It took the internet almost 40 years to get to where we are today. Blockchain's evolving faster than that. You will not need to be engineers. I am not a deep technologist, I promise you, and I know enough about consensus methodologies and blockchain to get myself in real trouble. There will be technical and implementations that specialist developers will have for you. There will be tools that your vendors and providers will make available. But you need to assign thought leaders, and you need to do it now. You will need to understand what it is and what it offers and why. If you haven't had to give advice on blockchain adoption, if you hadn't had a customer that walks in and says to you, what is Bitcoin, what is blockchain, you're lucky, but it's coming. I always enjoy this conversation with accountants. I always have an account that runs into me and says, Ron, I have a customer that made a couple of million dollars on Bitcoin. I don't know what it is. Bankers are not immune to this. Core banking vendors are already beginning work to help community banks leverage blockchain. And if you haven't been part of that dialogue, you need to be. So one of the things I always try to do for my colleagues in different industry verticals is offer resources. There's a lot of noise that's out there, including by some very famous people saying things like crypto assets and cryptocurrencies and blockchain are illegal, it's the worst scam of all time. I, and I hesitate to say it, but they're wrong. So I pulled out some of these resources. I've read every one of these books. Um, very selfishly, I was an editor of one, sorry. Um, but these are books worth looking at, they're books worth having, they're books worth sharing with your colleagues and worth sharing with your employees. As a matter of fact, that latest one, Blockchain and Cryptocurrency Regulation, we talked about it. Um, there is a digital version of that available, and if you would all like that, I can get a free copy to you, and we'll arrange that link through the application through my friends at Ide Bailey. But an important compendium of what regulations are evolving and what it means to banks of all sizes. And then, yes, frighteningly, we are on Twitter. If you have an opportunity, if you have staff that are on social media, let me help you cut through the noise of social media, because it's a mess. But these are some of the worthy organizations and people worth following. These are the thought leaders in blockchain and crypto assets that are helping to evolve industries around the world, including the Wall Street Blockchain Alliance. So I am shocked that I'm going to say this, but I am just about done, and I thought I was going to go long. So I wanted to thank you for your time. My goal here is that you walk out with at least that fundamental understanding of you being able to say what blockchain is and not being afraid of the conversations you need to have to evolve your businesses. So with that, I will stop and thank you. Uh, sure. We do. Okay. So, Ron, I think when we first started, we did the, uh, um, we asked the group here, you know, what was uh, some of the barriers to, uh, to innovation. And I think uh, one of the questions that first came up is, what should we look for in hiring staff as blockchain unfolds? What you should look for with? Uh, staffing, hiring staffing, staff. Sure. So I think there are, there are a couple of fundamental challenges for the adoption of blockchain across different industry verticals, particularly banking. <clears throat> One is education. And, I, and I, I, the education curve for me is, is paramount. Get a thought leader involved. You don't need just a technologist, but you do need people who come on board to understand enough about the use case that the technology represents to be able to argue why you should use it. And give them the opportunity within staff to peel back the layers of how you do what you do. Give them the opportunity to ask why. When I grew up, if you went to, I went to work at a big bank in the early days and I asked why one too many times. 
um, with horrible results. Give them the opportunity to ask why. Give them the opportunity to, from a product and use case perspective to map how you do it now and give them the ability to see where blockchain might play in that space. And the last thing I'd suggest there is there are a lot of resources for staff. There's a lot of resources out there, and we're happy to help point some of those out. Let them be ambassadors within the organization. Let them sell the story upstairs. Let them sell the understanding of what the technology is meant to accomplish. You don't need to hire just technologists. You could. But there's really smart, innovative young people that are looking at reinventing business models. And my argument is that community banks should be powering that for them as well. So another question that we have is, how can blockchain create more transparency if it is anonymous? Wouldn't you have to be able to trace to the original person to get the true transaction? So this strikes at the heart of the public-private blockchain conversation. The, in a public blockchain, that is absolutely correct. But remember, anonymous and transparent does not mean invisible. There are companies right now, Blockchain Intelligence Group, um, Elliptic, some other companies that are used by law enforcement today to track anonymous public blockchain transactions to monitor against illicit activity. But remember what we talked about with private blockchains. Private blockchains are still subject to the same rules and regulations. So we have to define what is personally identifiable information. That wallet address, how does that get mapped to Ron or to Gary? Bank and bank technology providers will be required to maintain that. So again, the answer is, we're not going to use public blockchain for that. We don't live in that world. We'll use private blockchains as a means to bridge that gap and live in the world that we know. And there's really complicated conversations over time around hybrid blockchains. Private blockchain at this layer that talks to public blockchain. I won't bore the audience with that, but my argument is that is years away. Private blockchains will need to adhere to the same requirements that banks adhere to now. It'll just be a different platform for them to do it. So what do you say to the, na to the naysayers out there, those that think that blockchain is just a fad and it's not scalable? So a couple of things, and I've had the opportunity to meet some of those naysayers. Um, blockchain as a technology is being used right now. Tell me why IBM is investing hundreds of millions of dollars. Tell me why most major governments around the world are looking to leverage blockchain transactions and platforms for everything from identity management to paying parking tickets. Tell me why Fidelity Investments is allocating millions upon millions of dollars to offer digital currency, crypto asset, and blockchain solutions and services to their clients. The innovations here, technology, blockchain technology, you can't undo that. We still have the challenges of what's it used for, how does it evolve, how do we stop bad people from using it, how do you not buy drugs and guns and stuff with Bitcoin, which you could do with the US dollar in the banking system currently? But the argument is that technology, it's evolving business practices right now. Look at IBM, by way of example. Walmart is leveraging blockchain technology to track provenance of food. And if you think you're getting truly organic food from wherever in the world, you would be shocked. But blockchain technology is allowing us to leverage that supply chain capability and use blockchain to track that provenance. So my argument to the naysayer is then why are we spending so much time? And by the way, those are the same naysayers who said the internet's never gonna be anything more than a fancy fax machine. And from the perspective of crypto assets, that's a valid point. 2,100 crypto assets around the world, more coming. But unless they show viable, valid use cases, they will go away. If someone's goal is to issue a token to become a millionaire and disappear, I promise you law enforcement's coming for you. But those crypto assets are going to be part of the global banking system as well. Any other questions from the room? I often put people entirely to sleep in my family about blockchain, so that may very well have happened. Ron, a <clears throat> uh, question for you. So. Um, talk about the 51% uh, you know, mechanism from a Bitcoin perspective or a cryptocurrency asset. Is that a real threat or is it sure. 
a fake threat. So Ross is referencing um, this idea of the 51% attack. If you think back to the network we were talking about, and these nodes, and, and I won't get into really complicated technology conversations about miners and nodes and validators, not worth your time and not relevant, but the idea that if someone owned 51% of the network, can they rewrite that history? A valid concern. In the public blockchain space, I'm less concerned about it. And the reason I'm less concerned about it, when you look at Bitcoin as the example, Bitcoin is the reward for being part of that network. Bitcoin's the reward for being one of those nodes if you're a miner. And so Bitcoin price moves, but some miners have made quite a bit of money. What happens if someone takes over 51% of the network? The entire rest of the network has zero incentive to continue to manage that. And so in not too far past, we saw the Bitcoin blockchain approach would just exceed the 51% margin, and Bitcoin's price promptly plummeted. A public blockchain network self-reinforces. And yes, there's really complicated conversations. China has the majority of Bitcoin miners, and state actors will, North Korea will hack blockchain. And as I mentioned earlier, the cybersecurity concerns for some of these don't go away. But I'm less concerned about the 51% in the public blockchain space. In the private blockchain space, that is fundamental to how that particular blockchain network is structured. If you and I are one blockchain, we probably don't need a blockchain. But if it's a small community that's leveraging blockchain, how do you manage? Do you need miners? Very technical, product-oriented conversations. And I would argue that the private implementations of blockchain that we've seen don't reference the 51% attack. It's not a concern in a private implementation. Because remember, at the end of the day, in a private blockchain, someone or something administers. Yes, sir. Um, what, um, what will be the most likely way community banks, I like this word, will be forced to use blockchain i.e., via their competitors using and customers expecting? So I, I hesitate to use the word forced, yeah. but I think, I think it'll happen in two ways. I, I, if you have not had clients, customers who've said they have some crypto asset or digital currency, or their son or daughter has crypto assets or digital currency, and they want to put it in the bank, um, community bankers are going to need to step forward and be part of that discussion. It's not just a big bank conversation. Please don't walk out of this room thinking that. There are a lot of different size organizations looking at crypto assets and how they manage it on behalf of their clients. I would argue on the blockchain as a technology platform side, Community bank vendors are already working on some of these platforms. Ask those questions now. Don't let it be sprung on you. Have someone within the organization that spearheads that relationship with vendors. Understand the tool sets that will be available to you. And understand, again, that phrase I often use, how do you do what you do? And think about how some of those services that will be available will grow. My argument is that community banks are not going away. Accountants are not going away. They'll just evolve. So I think we have uh, one more question here, and then we can wrap it up. Uh, uh, what are some of the largest strides in regulatory reform you're seeing in the US or internationally that allows for widespread adoption? So in the US, I, I, we've been very privileged to speak to a bunch of regulators um, around blockchain and crypto assets. And I'm actually much less concerned about regulators uh, than I am about legislators. Politicians seem to muck things up in the innovation space. Um, Regulators in particular are looking at evolving the different rules that we have existing now from a banking perspective, from a securities perspective. They want to offer the best benefits of what crypto assets and blockchain uh, offer, um, but they really do have the mandate to maintain investor protections and confidentiality and privacy and personally identifiable information. It, we have a similar conversation in healthcare with the management under HIPAA and other regulations of patient information. If you have eight doctors, you've got at least eight different data sets that need to be reconciled. So regulators are looking to and putting forward um, proposals and best practice recommendations around some of that. And in some egregious instances, regulators are coming forward and sanctioning. Or it's submitting cease and desist. We're seeing a lot of this in financial markets now. Um, 
And I think from a technology perspective, just to finish off that question, um, they are really interested in being part of the innovation cycle. So when you look at some of the bigger regulators, CFTC has a, um, an innovation hub that, that members and firms from around the country can plug into um, to understand how blockchain might improve their workflows. SEC is doing the same thing. Banking regulators are having that conversation right now. Um, so I would suggest don't be afraid of the conversation with the regulators. They probably want to get as up to speed as you do. Help me. Oh, we have a question. I have a question over here. <coughs> question over here. I, I understand the importance of understanding this, talking about it, thinking, planning. Can, can you give us your opinion in terms of when the banks in this room would see what you're describing with frequency? Are you talking 36 months, 60 months, 72 months? How far away? I always love those prediction questions. So. If, if, Thank you for that. Um, the, the simple answer that is probably not an answer is I don't know. But I can tell you I don't think it's 60 months away. We're seeing young people getting paid in crypto assets right now. We're seeing blank banking platforms, particularly with the large banks, honestly, evolving now, leveraging blockchain technology. And we're seeing things like trade finance and real estate underwriting evolving now. I would argue, and, and I'm certain Ross, you'll have to reach out to me in a few years and tell me if my prediction was right. Within 24 to 36 months, there will be portions of your day-to-day -day business somewhere in the cycle that is leveraging crypto assets or blockchain technology. And that might sound how, like hyperbole, and it might sound, I remember this conversation in 2015. We would always have the conversation, and someone would say, <clears throat> Ron, if this year is pilot, next year is production. And every year, we were all like, yes, production next year. And of course, it didn't happen. Um, I would argue, again, in the next 24 to 36 months, if you don't have a valid, deep knowledge of what it's trying to accomplish, if you're not aware of some of the tools in the background that are leveraging blockchain and crypto assets, you've fallen behind. And that's not meant to be scary. It, it, it is the nature of it. Um, innovation is happening at an accelerating rate. We all see the Gartner hype cycle and the conversations around trough of disillusionment and when it becomes mainstream. We're coming out of trough of disillusionment in my mind from a blockchain perspective. Crypto assets are still a little scary, but that's okay. But uh, it's coming, and it's coming sooner than you think. This is, you don't need this for just a 10-year roadmap. At, at least you didn't ask me to predict Bitcoin's price. I'm just, I'm grateful. <laughs> All right, help me thank Ron for that presentation. Thank you. Thank you.